thank you for your patience as we made everything ship shape here. I'm delighted you're here. And uh, I know we have an audience out there in Zoom land too. And so you're welcome as well, of course. Uh, my name is Tom Morgan. I am the director of the Allworth Center for the study of peace and justice here at the College of St. Scholastica. Uh, this is the first of eight topics, eight lectures that we have uh, this academic year that we're doing in cooperation with the Royal Allworth Institute for International Studies at UMD. We've already had lectures on China and Russia. And next week, a week from tonight at UMD will be a lecture on India. But tonight is Latin America, as you all know. These lectures at St. Scholastica are sponsored by the Allworth Center for the Study of Peace and Justice at St. Scholastica and founded and funded in part by the Warner series of the Manitou Fund, the DeWitt and Carolyn Van Ever Foundation and the Mary C. Van Ever Foundation Endowed Fund in memory of William Van Ever. Additional support has been received from the, Golden, from the Global Awareness Fund of the Duluth Superior Area Community Foundation, the Edwin H. Eddy Foundation, the Royal D. Allworth Jr. Institute at the University of Minnesota, Duluth, the UMD Department of World Languages and Cultures, Reader Weekly, Duluth Sister Cities International, the League of Women Voters of Duluth, and from many other private sources. And just a reminder again, that the lecture on India is a week from tonight, 7 p.m. UMD 200 Chemistry Building at UMD. And that's the old building, I believe, the very first building at UMD, if I'm not mistaken. So that's 2 p.m. Um, if you're interested in being on our mailing list um, or getting emails from me on a regular basis, there is a sign-up sheet uh, in the back of the auditorium. Fill it out, print legibly. Sometimes I can't read your writing and that makes it hard to get your email correct. But um, happy to keep you in the loop with postcards or with emails. After this uh, talk, we have two speakers here, so it'll be doubly good, won't it? Uh, Q&A, and the Q&A, uh, for those people here in the hall, you just come right up to that microphone, and uh, you can address the speakers directly. Everybody out there in Zoom land should hear it as well. For those people who are uh, connecting with us via Zoom, there is a, I think, yes, there is a Q&A button at the, should be a Q&A button at the bottom of your screen at home, and you type in your question there, and I will read it, especially if it's in good King's English, then I will read it, and I'll put it to the speakers. Um, I think that is all the housekeeping I need to do right now. And so the next thing I would normally do at these events is introduce the speakers and I'm going to do that, but give me a couple of minutes for a personal reflection. I've been doing this for 30 years and I've never given anybody a personal reflection from this podium. I always defer to our guests, but today I, I would like to do it because uh, as many of you know, this is my last evening standing in front of you introducing folks for the Allworth Center for the Study of Peace and Justice. It's been a wonderful 32 years. It's been a wild ride. And I feel like I'm quoting Lou Gehrig. You know, I'm the luckiest man in the world, or at least in Duluth, because what is my job? I've asked, people have asked me, well, what exactly do you do? Well, one of the things that I do is I read books and I find interesting books to read. And then I think, boy, wouldn't it be something to get the author of one of these books to the college? And then I invite them here and I meet the author and have wonderful conversations with the author and share the author's wisdom with the greater Duluth community. What a great job. Um, and we have had, uh, well, as I said, more than 30 years of doing this, or I have, and I just wrote a list of some of the topics just the last 15 years that we've looked at. Just reminisce with me. We've discussed energy. We had a whole, uh, a whole evening on energy. We've done food. We've done sustainability. We've done the future of democracy. We've done global poverty, or at least we've we touched on the issues. I don't see we did all of it. Uh, 
We looked at religion as a force for good or ill. We looked at race relations. We talked about specific issues um, of concern. Palestine, Israel was one. We looked at terrorism as a global phenomenon. We looked at violence one year as a, as a psychological phenomenon. Where does violence come from? We looked at America's role in the world. We looked at the media. We had a whole year on the media once, and one year we talked about biotechnology as an upcoming issue that we all have to face, and the list goes on. It's been a wonderful ride, and I just want to take this moment to thank just a few people that I've written on this card. And for openers, I want to thank the administrations of the College of St. Scholastic. And notice I use the word plural because I'm on my fourth president right now <laughs> here, Barbara McDonald. I mean, I have gone through four, but every one of these administrators, the presidents that I have served under has been very supportive from the very beginning. I've never felt anything but support and encouragement on the part of the administration of the college. And that includes Barbara McNaught, but it includes the other ones as well. Larry Goodwin and, and uh, Dan Pilon, who hired me, and um, uh, Geary, you know, Charlotte Geary. Um, so they've all been wonderful to me. Um, and some of the programs that we've done over the years, of those of you who are regulars will know that they've been sometimes controversial, sometimes uh, people speak, saying things that us, that we in the Midwest don't want to hear. And then of course we get complaints. And most of those complaints ultimately, I think landed in the president's office. People complained to me, but I could just blow them off. But the big complaints I know were fielded by the various presidents that I've served under and they always deflected that and always defended me every, every time and uh, supported the idea of, of having this be, what, an open pulpit where all ideas are welcome and that we can all learn from one another and respect one another and respect one another's ideas. So I wanna thank the administration of the College of St. Scholastica for giving me this wonderful job and for being so supportive, but that doesn't end there. Then there's the always. I can't remember a lecture that we had here when there wasn't at least one Allworth in attendance and usually more than one. Here we have two right here. And, and I'm so grateful. They have been wonderful patrons, absolutely wonderful. Michelangelo should have been so lucky with his patron because um, they've been supportive. I've had a chance, I meet with them once or twice a year on a regular basis. And, uh, but they, they're just like the administration of the college. They never said, we can't do this or we can't do that, or I won't tolerate that sort of speaker. We've never, never said that. Um, they've always been supportive of anything that I've tried to do or propose. Sometimes they're critical, that's okay. Sometimes they have good ideas. I don't claim to have all the good ideas, but it's been a wonderful working relationship. And I wanna publicly thank the Allworths for their support, their financial support and their moral support over the years. They helped make this happen. <laughs> Indulge me, this is the only time I'll ever get to do this. A couple of other people that I, I really want to thank. And one of them is a woman of a certain age who lives in Fort Lee, New Jersey, right across the river from the Big Apple. And one of her claims to fame among many is that she went to high school with Barbara Streisand. So you can kind of get a picture of what this woman is all about. And she and I had a telephone, began a telephone um, relationship 25 or 30 years ago, I'm not sure when, because I was working with her. She was representing one of the speakers I had and we kind of hit it off. Her name is Freda Cray and uh, Every year over the last, well, 20 years, I would come up with topics, come up with speakers. And some of these speakers were a reach. People who lived in exotic places, whose lifetime dream was not to come to Duluth, Minnesota. And I would call up, and how am I gonna get somebody like that to come to Duluth? 
So I would call up Freda, who had a long history as an agent before she sort of went into semi-retirement, a talent agent and a, and a press agent, and she knew what buttons to push and she knew who to call. And so I always said that she's the secret sauce. She's the one who helped me get some of these very difficult people uh, to find and to persuade to come to Duluth. So uh, Freda, if you're out there, uh, thank you very much. You are, are one of the keys to my success or the success of this program. Another one is a person who just recently retired here from St. Scholastica, Janet Rosen, who was uh, head of, I don't remember what her title is, but she worked on grants and uh, what's her title, Janet Rosen? development and grants and yeah anyway every year I would sit and meet with her about this time of the year or sometimes maybe in December here's the topic Janet how can we get some grants for this and she knew what buttons to push just like Freda Cray and Janet and I would work and we would get some grants for the next program um, other people that I at least want to mention you can't mention everybody but there was Sue Mackey who's left the college a couple of years ago she and I worked, uh, she was kind of the producer of this, and she and I worked together many, many times to put these programs on. And she did a lot of the hard back behind the scenes work. Right now, we have Brianne Tepler, and she's somewhere here. And she is the producer now, extraordinaire of these programs. And uh, last year, when COVID hit hard, uh, we came to an early conclusion that none of these, to these talks would be possible face-to-face. Uh, -face. And so we were going to do the entire program on Zoom. And I hadn't a clue on how to do that, but Brian did. And so Brian saved the day for me and for all of us by making that work so well. And she has lots of good ideas about marketing and technology, and she deserves to be acknowledged as well. And another one, another fellow connected with the college, I think he's leaving too, Jim Pounds. Lots of good ideas about marketing and, media and the media. Well, the whole IT and the marketing department at St. Scholastica. Just another person I have to mention. I'm sorry to keep you so long, but I just have to do this. Uh, uh, a young, or older man by the name of Tom Starkey lives out. Um, in, uh, in Spirit Valley, and he approached me about 20 years ago, liked these programs so much, he wanted to help. And the next thing I knew, he was my man on the street and he was distributing posters and arranging talkback sessions in other venues for me and just a great help, a great volunteer help for all those years. So Tom, I thank you. Then of course, Cindy Christian, she's here, my counterpart at UMD. Cindy and I have had lots of chance to collaborate over the years. And that feels really good because we're only three blocks away. So we should be talking to each other. And of course, my colleagues at St. Scholastica, who've always been very supportive and you, the audience as well. I know I've missed some people, but at least I got a few of the thank yous in and I wanted to do, oh yes, one more thank you. My long suffering wife, Julie, who put up with this for 30 years and all my anxieties about whether these shows would go on or not. And um, she endured it all. And, uh, and she, I appreciate that. And I appreciate her support. And she never misses one, but she's out, probably out there Zooming, I'm, I'm pretty sure, uh, right now. So I thank you all for your support. If you didn't continue to support these programs, I know they would die. So thank you, I thank you. <laughs> Now, on with the program. Thank you for that, for indulging me with that. Uh, we have two speakers, as you can see, in this evening's program, both of whom did their graduate work in Latin American history at Yale. Uh, one currently is teaching at Washington State University in Vancouver, and the other is teaching right here in Duluth at St. Scholastica. Professor Chastain at my far left, the one from Vancouver, is particularly interested in modern Chile and has done research in Chile, France, Brazil, Mexico, and the United States. Her work has been supported by the Social Science Research Council, the PFO Foundation, and the Conference on Latin American History. She's received numerous awards and special recognition for her research and publications, the most recently being 
the 2020 Students Award for Teaching Excellence presented by the students of Washington State University at Vancouver. In her spare time, Professor Chastain uh, enjoys running, hiking, and watching, and listening to comedies. She lives in Vancouver with her husband, Andrew, and their children, Galen, four years old, and um, Sylvia, who turns one year old on Friday. Professor Lorick, to my immediate left, has taught at Brandeis, the University of Hartford, and at Yale before he came to CSS this year. He's also worked in educational outreach at the University of Michigan as a Mellon Research Fellow at the New York Botanical Garden in the Bronx and in community agriculture in Albuquerque. Professor Lorick researches and writes about the history, environment, and politics of agriculture in Latin America, particularly in Colombia and Puerto Rico. He's currently completing a book manuscript dealing with these issues in Colombia. Originally from Wisconsin, Professor Lorick and his family are happy to call the Northland their home, where they spend as much time as they can on the water, on the trail, or in the garden. He lives in Duluth with his wife, Stephanie, a teacher, and their children, Claire, age five, and Jamie, three. Professors Lorick and Chastain are co-editors of the recently released book, Itineraries of Expertise, Science, Technology, and the Environment in Latin America's Long Cold War. Oh yes, and beginning in 2022, Tim Lorick is the new director of the Allworth Center for the Study of Peace and Justice here at CSS. Congratulations, Tim. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Professor, Professors Andre Chastain and Timothy Lorick. Tom, you didn't think we were just gonna let you talk, did you? <laughs> My goodness. I'd like, to, I'd like to call uh, Barbara McDonald to the stage, please. Oh, goodness. <laughs> it's taking too long. Do I have to put my mask on? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Tim. And good evening, everyone. Tonight, we have a very special uh, surprise and recognition of Dr. Tom Morgan. For over 32 years, Professor Morgan has served the College of St. Scholastica in remarkable ways, living out our mission to prepare learners for lives of purpose and meaning. So let me tell you a little bit about Tom. Tom has taught Russian language and culture for many years. He's particularly interested in cross-cultural issues and has explored in a variety of ways the experience of American and Canadian Finns in Soviet Russia. In 1989, Dr. Morgan founded and directed the Russian Exchange Program. Some of you might be familiar with it. This program was an extension of a grassroots peace movement that had begun in the 1980s to establish a citizen to citizen dialogue with a city in Russia. That city ended up being Petrozavog. Thanks to his collaborative work, summer language camps were launched and over the years, Russian and St. Scholastica students visited each other's countries in alternating years that program celebrated its 30th anniversary this year. Dr. Morgan's scholarly work includes a co-authored text of advanced grammar of English in Russian that was published in Russia in a second edition in 2001. The first edition was published in 1997. He was also instrumental in developing Russian language and culture curriculum. He has also taught courses in Russian literature, philosophy, honors courses with a peace and justice theme, and a course on peaceful resolution of international conflict. Additionally, he was involved in the development of the Duluth International Peace Center, a citizens group that functioned for many years in the 1990s to foster international cooperation and peacemaking. He was also a charter member of the Duluth Sister City Coalition. Professor Morgan was key in growing the college's peace and justice studies from a minor to a major. He is, in fact, the reason we are all here tonight. <laughs> 
When he joined the college community, the lecture series was still in its formative stages. Under Tom's leadership as director of the Allworth Center for Peace and Justice, the series has grown from one major lecture a year to three to six. It attracts many members of the community in addition to CSS members and invites participants to consider how they see themselves in the wider context. How do we understand the human story in a bigger way? And again, Tom's impacts are far reaching. During the past few years, at least one peace and justice lecture has been incorporated into our first year experience, Dignitas. And Minnesota Public Radio now carries the lectures on programming all over the state. Dr. Morgan also teaches a course related to the lecture series each year. Tom, we are so very grateful for your extraordinary career at St. Scholastica and for the ways in which you have shaped hundreds of students' lives. We thank you for your leadership with the Allworth series and for your deep commitment to your teaching and scholarship over the years. As an expression of our gratitude, we, we present you with this wonderful piece and we hope this chair gives you many, many, many hours of well-deserved relaxation and joy in the next chapter of your life. So, Tom. <laughs> okay, we're way behind schedule. On with the show. Uh, I look more professional. All right. Thank you. Uh, thank you all for being here. Thank you to Tom one more time. Uh, we, Andra and I are really excited to be here uh, to be part of this series. I should mention from the get-go, neither of us are from Latin America, so uh, I think this is a tall task for us to present perspectives from Latin America, but uh, we, will, we will do our best. So uh, we're also a little bit uncomfortable for reasons I think will become obvious during the talk with the idea of, of the perspective of the other when we talk about Latin America, because Latin Americans have endured a long history of othering from the, the perspective of the United States. Uh, but with those caveats, our objective tonight is just going to be to think critically about some major issues affecting Latin America, a huge and diverse and complex region. And with that, I'm going to pass it over to Andra to start us off. Great. Thank you. And good evening. Thank you very much to Dr. Tim Lorick and Dr. Tom Morgan for the invitation to be here tonight. So in my remarks, um, I'd like to give you a quick glimpse at some of the current challenges facing Latin America with a focus on an ongoing social uprising in Chile. Um, then I'd like to move back to look at some of the roots of the current challenges, which um, I'd like to argue, and, and Tim will pick up on this, that these issues um, had their roots in Latin America's long Cold War. And I'm going to give special focus on Chile's experience during and after the Cold War. I think he's on. Oh, okay. So a couple of weeks ago, thousands of protesters streamed into a central plaza in Santiago, which is the capital of Chile and a city of 6 million people. This plaza is known as Plaza de la Dignidad or Dignity Plaza. And it's, it's a wide traffic circle and it, became, and it used to hold an imposing statue of 19th century war hero, Manuel Baquedano. Um, this statue, because of its placement at the center of this massive social uprising, became targeted with graffiti and colorful slogans, as you can sort of see in this image, um, and it was removed earlier this year. The protesters who gathered and filled the streets were commemorating two years since the start of a huge wave of social protests that began in Chile in October of 2019. They chanted slogans and waved banners that read, it's now or never, we've said enough, Chile is not for sale. They were protesting many things, including three decades of neoliberal economic policies that have not resolved Chile's intense inequality, 
um, as well as the victims who have suffered from excessive police force um, since the uprising two years ago. This upswell of protests and mobilizations in Chile is the largest in three decades, and it's known as the Estallido Social, or social uprising. It began when a fair hike um, on Santiago's mass transportation system, the, the Metro, um, it was protested by high school students who called for mass fare evasion. Um, and this, the protest rapidly spread to other sectors of society. People quickly flooded the streets call, um, with protests and demands against a number of issues. Um, they were protesting the expropriation of lands from indigenous communities in Chile. They were protesting gender violence and systemic sexism, privatized pensions, unaffordable health care, um, environmental degradation, and the privatization of natural resources, and political corruption. And perhaps most of all, they were calling for the end of the 1980 constitution, which had been in place since the dictatorship of Augusto Pinochet, which I will talk about in a few minutes. The protests continued day after day, week after week, from October 2019 well into 2020, um, until the pandemic overtook Chile and you know, overtook the world and changed the game. Now, the, up, the uprising was so intense and long lasting that it forced the right wing government of billionaire Sebastian Piñera to make concessions in the name of social peace. He had already tried repressing the demonstrations uh, by calling out the military onto the streets, which was a painful reminder of the military dictatorship, uh, but that didn't work. Um, in fact, Amnesty International documented the intentional use of excessive force to punish protesters, resulting in the deaths of at least five people at the hands of the military and the torture and serious injury to thousands more. Uh, dozens suffered um, eye trauma and even blindness because of um, the use of rubber bullets by the police that were intentionally targeting protesters' heads and faces. And in fact, the blindfold became a major symbol of the movement as a result. So when excessive force did not work, uh, Pineda conceded and agreed to a plan drawn up by um, a legislative coalition. So they called for a plebiscite specifically about this 1980 constitution. The question was, should the constitution be rewritten? And if so, who should be rewriting it? Should it be um, a collection of uh, current legislators or should it be a completely elected citizen assembly? Um, in October, so a year ago of 2020, voters voted overwhelmingly in support of a new constitution and to have it drafted completely by elected citizens. It was to have none of the current politicians. They were accused of maintaining the political status quo. Um, and it would also be the first constitution in the world drafted by an equal number of women and men. Uh, in May of this year, voters went to the polls and elected that constitutional assembly. And the results dealt a blow to the center-right coalition um, that was behind the billionaire president, Sebastian Piñera. Um, they didn't win even a third of the votes, which meant that they would not be able to veto any of the measures in the constitution. And in addition, um, independents picked up the most seats. So this was very fittingly a response uh, of frustration to the politicians already in power. But perhaps most strikingly, um, the Constitutional Assembly elected as its president, a woman named Elisa Loncon, who is an indigenous Mapuche activist with two PhDs um, in the humanities and literature, um, a woman who has campaigned to bring the Mapuche native language, Mapudungun, into the Chilean school system. Now, frustration and discontent at the political status quo and the legacies of inequality in Latin America are certainly not limited to Chile. So I'll just mention a couple of other cases in terms of current day events. In Brazil, the far right president, uh, Jair Bolsonaro, openly waxes nostalgic for the military dictatorship that ruled Brazil from 1964 to 1985. Through COVID denial and vaccine hesitation and government mismanagement, Bolsonaro's government has created the conditions for uh, the coronavirus to spread like wildfire. It has hit every part of Brazil, but perhaps most of all, um, it has hit the Amazon very hard where indigenous residents um, have died at very high rates uh, as, hospital, as hospitals run out of oxygen. 
in October, just a couple of weeks ago, a legislative panel in Brazil accused Bolsonaro and other government officials of crimes against humanity for their mishandling of the pandemic, which has resulted in over 600,000 deaths in Brazil. That is the second highest death toll in the world after the United States. With currently now high unemployment and rising prices, Bolsonaro's approval has gone down and thousands of people are now turning out on the streets demanding for his impeachment. The coronavirus pandemic has also hit other Latin American countries very hard. And in all of these cases, Chile, Brazil, and Peru, which I'll mention, legacies of socioeconomic inequality and racial inequality have exacerbated the virus's toll. In Peru, which has unfortunately the grim distinction of the highest death rate in the world, so the highest death, deaths per capita in the world, um, big gaps in wealth and education and um, health outcomes separate the haves from the have-nots. Despite Peru having a very stable economy, a stable, stable economy and a lucrative mining sector, the wealth has not trickled down to rural peasants, many of them um, indigenous um, highlanders. More recently in, in, sorry, in Peru, there has been a bitter and drawn out election contest that has pitted the daughter of Peru's former dictator. Her name is Keiko Fujimori. She's the daughter of Alberto Fujimori, has pitted her against an indigenous school teacher and union leader named Pedro Castillo. Um, and just a few months ago, Pedro Castillo did take office um, in July of 2021. So with all of these current challenges from socioeconomic and racial inequality to political polarization and anti-democratic policies, continuing accusations of corruption and human rights abuses, this begs the question, how did we get here? I'd like to turn our attention now to some of the deeper histories that shape Latin America today. So as Tim and I will both show, the roots of many of Latin America's current challenges were planted during the Latin American Cold War. Now, what was the Latin American Cold War? Um, perhaps, you know, when you think of the Cold War, um, you think primarily of the global conflict between the superpowers, between the United States and the Soviet Union that began shortly after World War II and ended with the fall of the USSR in 1991. You may also think of the Korean War, the Vietnam War, but the Cold War was truly a global conflict. Um, it impacted anti-imperial struggles and nationalist movements in Africa and Asia and the Middle East. And in the case of Latin America, it became grafted onto longer and deeper struggles. Um, these struggles included national liberation movements, uh, calls for land reform, and calls for economic sovereignty, all of which, many of which began before World War II. So consider that Cuba was fighting against Spain in the 1890s, just as the United States swept in, declared Cuba unfit for self-rule, and brought Cuba under its sway. Or consider that the first great social revolution of the 20th century was the Mexican Revolution, which broke out in 1910 with calls for um, uh, land and liberty, um, for land redistribution. Or consider that um, there were many calls for the nationalization of natural resources um, before the you know, official start of the Cold War. Mexico nationalized its oil in 1938, um, and there were calls um, throughout the region for that. But during and after World War II, these calls for redistribution gained greater momentum. At the time, it seemed like world historical forces, um, not to mention the might, the military might of the United States, it seemed like those forces were on the side of democracy and freedom allied against fascism. In Latin America, for about 10 years, from 1944 or so until 1954, there was a sort of Latin American spring that blossomed as social democratic and progressive governments won elections throughout the region and proposed measures to redistribute wealth and resources. In Guatemala, for example, the democratic governments of Juan Jose Arevalo and Jacobo Arbenz um, were elected and sought major land reform 
they wanted to expropriate land from the United Fruit Company um, and redistribute it to landless peasants. Or in Brazil, also after World War II, there was a democratic opening with workers groups rising in influence and elected leaders adopting nationalist policies, including the nationalization of the oil industry. But this Latin American spring was quickly shut down by Cold War forces that wanted to contain anything that um, might be perceived as socialist or communist. These forces included both the United States, which by the 1950s was operating in a much more rigid anti-communist framework, as well as national elites in Latin America that themselves feared um, a loss of power that redistribution would entail. In 1954, uh, the CIA fomented a military coup in Guatemala that overthrew our bends and installed Colonel Cast Carlos Castillo Armas as president. Um, he was friendly to US interests and also set the stage for Guatemala's destabilization and ultimately three decades of civil war. In 1964, the US assisted a coup in Brazil that overthrew Democratic President Joao Goulart and installed a military dictatorship there that would last until 1985. And we see on this um, slide um, a mural by Diego Rivera that portrays the coup in Guatemala uh, with a number of the, uh, with Carlos Castillo Armas uh, with his hand outstretched and um, several of the US actors involved in the coup as well. Now, Latin American radicals learned from these interventions that halted progressive democratic reforms. They took away from these examples, especially the 1954 coup in Guatemala, the lesson that in order to enact real change, revolutionary violence would be necessary. To take one example, um, Ernesto Che Guevara the Argentine doctor who became a revolutionary fighter in Cuba. He was actually in Guatemala City during the coup in 1954. And he came away with a renewed dedication to revolutionary struggle, which he would take into the mountains of Cuba um, in the fight against um, the dictator Fulgencio Batista together with Fidel Castro. And they were ultimately successful in that revolution in 1959. So in sum, by the 1960s, an intense cycle of reform, revolution, and counter-revolution was already established in Latin America, and that would greatly shape its experience in the Cold War. All right, so I'd like to talk now about how this cycle played out in Chile, which is the focus of my research. In the 1960s, um, there were increasing calls for reform um, and progressive, um, for progressive reforms. Um, in Chile, there are basically three groups. There was the, the right wing, the center, and the left. Um, and the left was led by a doctor, a socialist doctor named Salvador Allende. Um, and his movement was gaining ground in the 60s. He was defeated in 1964 um, when um, a man named Eduardo Fremontalvo was elected. He was a Christian Democrat, um, a Catholic, and he had a progressive vision for redistributing uh, resources in Chile. He was also backed by the right wing and also backed by covert US support. The United States was very worried about a Marxist victory in Chile. Now, they did enact many reforms, but they also uh, raised people's expectations significantly. So they enacted land reforms, um, began uh, increased Chilean control over the copper industry. Um, but by the late 60s, there was increasing polarization and people's hopes for you know, more affordable housing, for rapid land reform, um, they, those hopes were not met. And so you see increasing polarization um, and radicalism by the late 60s. <clears throat> so in 1970, um, Salvador Allende's um, coalition, which included the communists and the socialists and other left-wing parties was elected in Chile in 1970. What they called for was unprecedented. They wanted a peaceful and democratic path to socialism. So not the violence of Cuba or Vietnam, but a legal and electoral path. Allende and his coalition, uh, the Popular Unity Coalition, won a plurality, so only a little bit more than th a third of the vote. Um, and although the US sought to stop him from taking office, he did take office in 1970. 
So <clears throat> Allende's election was a watershed moment in the Chilean, in the, in the Latin American Cold War. It was the most significant revolutionary success in the Americas since the Cuban Revolution. And it was significant because of this attempt to enact socialism peacefully and democratically. Um, it was known as the Chilean path or the La Via Chilena. Um, now, rapidly multiple attentions emerged. Um, the governing coalition wanted to do things through electoral processes, but they had unleashed people's hopes for a rapid change. And so you see a revolution from below as peasants seized land in the countryside, homeless residents seized vacant lots in the cities to create shanty towns, and workers seized their factories. They wanted to nationalize things on their own timeline and not on the government's timeline. At the same time, there was intense opposition from the center and the right on the, in the Chilean political system, as well as from opposition from the United States. Um, specifically, Nixon told the CIA that he wanted to make the economy scream. So there was an invisible blockade. The United States cut off credit to Allende, which exacerbated um, a growing economic crisis. And I have to mention that the US was, not, was terrified of Allende's victory, not so much because he feared that this was going to become a beachhead of Soviet influence in Latin America, but because it represented the possibility of electoral, of Marxist parties coming to power through the electoral process. So they worried that this might set an example for the socialist parties and the communist parties in Western Europe. Ultimately, Allende had few options, few good options. He didn't want to arm the people. He didn't want to arm the people to have them fight back with force because that was not um, his way. Um, but his opponents were convinced that a civil war was brewing and that Allende would seize control by force. And ultimately they carried out a coup. On September 11th, 1973, the Chilean military overthrew Allende. The Air Force bombed the presidential palace in Santiago, destroying a symbol of Chile's longstanding democratic tradition. A four person military junta took power and very quickly the leader emerged. This was General Augusto Pinochet. And he would hold power from 1973 until 1990. This caused an enormous climate of shock um, and fear in Chile. Chileans thought this could never happen in their country. Or if there were a coup, that it would quickly return to democratic process, but this was not the case. Instead, we see 17 years of dictatorship that completely remade the society. <clears throat> Tens of thousands of people, the, uh, supporters of Allende, uh, were rounded up and tortured and imprisoned. Um, over 3,000 people were assassinated um, or disappeared. These were people who were um, killed by the government um, and their bodies disposed of in unknown locations. Um, the government declared having no knowledge of this, and so the families um, searched and searched for any sort of knowledge of their loved ones. Many of them are still searching today. And thousands of Chileans fled into exile as well. Tens of thousands, rather, fled into exile. <clears throat> the military dictatorship of Pinochet would hold power for 17 years, from 1973 to 1990. And the dictatorship was characterized by two important dimensions. On the one hand, the regime uh, carried out intense political repression uh, using human rights abuses. Um, they sought to um, depoliticize society. So political parties were banned, um, the legislature was abolished, um, and they were stridently anti-communist. Left-wing activists were arrested and tortured and killed. And even the centrists, the Christian Democrats, were targeted um, and purged from the government ranks. And not only that, but attacks on opposition um, stretch outside of Chile's boundaries. So, for example, in 1976, um, Orlando Letelier, um, who was a former official in Allende's government, an economist, was assassinated on U.S. soil in Washington, D.C. Um, he was killed along with his co-worker, um, Ronnie Moffat. Um, they also sought to kill um, a Christian Democrat, Bernardo Layton, um, a failed attempt in Rome in 1975. So that's sort of one dimension, the political repression. 
Um, at the same time, they also carried out economic, what they called economic, economic shock therapy, um, radical free market reforms that sought to remake the Chilean economy. The Pinochet government brought in um, economic advisors known as the Chicago Boys. These were Chilean economists who had been trained at the University of Chicago and then um, were eventually brought into the government. Um, they had goals of reigning in inflation and they did that through austerity measures. Um, this caused significant recession at first. Um, it also did lead, it did cause some economic growth in the late 70s, early 80s. And some observers looked at this and described it as the Chilean miracle. So we see high rates of GDP growth for certain periods of time. Um, but this was followed in 1982 by a really big economic crash. So these kind of boom and bust cycles returning um, and economic growth then returns again in the late 80s. So in 1990, Chile formally transitioned to democracy. Um, there was a plebiscite in 1988, elections in 89, and then in 1990, the first democratic government um, since Allende took office. It's important to know that this transition happened within a framework, within the framework set by the military regime, specifically um, within the framework of the 1980 constitution. Pinochet's legal advisors, um, had drawn up this constitution. It was voted on, but in a climate where legal, where opposition was outlawed. So it is, you know, essentially held as fraudulent by uh, voters today. And not only that, in terms of the sort of constraints of the democratic transition, but one example of this is that Pinochet was actually commander in chief of the armed forces up until 1998. So this democratic transition happened, but it was very constrained. In addition, Pinochet's economic legacies are very strong. From 1990 until 2010, there was a center-left uh, democratic coalition in power known as the Concertación. And despite their kind of centrist, left-leaning tendencies, they actually maintained and even deepened those free market policies that, that Pinochet had put in place. So they sought foreign investment. Um, they wanted a very business-friendly environment in Chile, um, public-private partnerships, and although lots of reforms have significantly reduced poverty, they have not resolved the problem of inequality in Chile. So economic precarity, unaffordable health care, debt-driven um, education, debt-driven consumption, um, and a general sense that people do not have a say in their governments and in their, in their politics, these are some of the many frustrations that continue to um, resonate in Chile and continue to drive frustrations and are some of the many reasons behind the social uprising that I mentioned at the beginning of my talk. All right. So like Chile, Colombia also served as a critical Cold War center within Latin America. I'll talk about the history of Colombia during the Cold War in Latin America briefly in just a moment. But first, I want to talk a little bit about Colombian geography and then a little bit about contemporary Colombia and the historical memory movement. So first, many people, uh, I have maps up here because many people often describe uh, the Colombian armed conflict as something that is completely uh, not understandable unless you can understand some basics about Colombian geography. So, Colombia uh, is an incredibly big and diverse country in terms of its population, its cultures, and its geography. It includes three chains of the Andes Mountains. It includes the Amazon rainforest, a vast tropical savanna known as the Llanos, and two oceans, two coasts, the Caribbean coast and the Pacific coast. And so within each of these regions, there are large mega cities, there are agricultural valleys. There are many diverse uh, sort of eco regions and agricultural regions. And so this is a complicated country and one that is often described as being very difficult for a, a single state to govern uh, effectually. So I want to pose that at the outset that when we talk about, about political conflicts in Colombia, it's important to understand the, the depth and complexity of these places. 
So first, a little bit about contemporary Colombia. So contemporary Colombia, like a lot of countries uh, in Latin America, from Chile, but also around the world, places like South Africa and Spain, contemporary Colombia has a vibrant historical memory movement. In the 2010s, as the country's government began to negotiate what would become the eventual 2016 peace accord with the hemisphere's oldest continuing guerrilla insurgency, the Revolutionary Armed Forces of Colombia, or the FARC, which I will talk about a lot uh, momentarily. A new wave of books, documentaries, reports, and archive advanced the critical project of documenting the country's long and complicated armed conflict. The National Center for Historical Memory, which published this 2013 book, is just one expression of this, but it's one recognized by the United Nations for its work in, quote, reconstructing through the testimony of victims, the serious human rights violations that occurred in the framework of the conflict, searching for truth, justice, reparation, and the construction of a sustainable and lasting peace. So the prevalence of this so-called memory movement in Colombia and around Latin America has attempted with various degrees of success to document the human rights abuses committed, committed during the region's long Cold War, during the long history of military dictatorships in the 1970s and 80s, such as that in Chile, as well as the civil wars in Central America during the 1980s. Speaking of Central America, for example, one of the most famous examples of this is the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in Guatemala, which declared that the military's violence, which accounted for 93% of the crimes against civilians during the country's long civil war, according to figures from the United Nations, particularly focused on terrorizing the highland Mayan communities of that country and between 1981 and 1983 effectually carried out a genocide. In Colombia, from a US perspective, we often think of and hear about the Colombian armed conflict as a civil war, pitting the country's leftist guerrilla insurgencies like the FARC against, against the government. And Excuse me. In the U.S., uh, for example, both the, the, the two most famous leftist insurgency groups, the FARC and the ELN, or the National Liberation uh, Army, are designated by the Department of State as terrorist organizations. In the country's largest union of paramilitary organizations, the United Self-Defense Forces of Colombia, was designated a terrorist organization that delisted in 2014. Nevertheless, according again to the United Nations, approximately 80% of civilian casualties during Colombia's long conflict have been perpetuated by, perpetrated by paramilitary organizations. So thus, this sort of US perspective of thinking about this as a civil war between a, a, a united leftist guerrilla insurgency and the Colombian government is, is grossly inadequate for understanding the country's long, complex, and evolving conflict. So what is this history in brief of Colombia's armed conflict? And how should we understand the movements for peace and the movements for justice today in contemporary Colombia? I'll note just a few things about Colombian history. And I'm happy to talk more about this during the question and answer if people are interested. Uh, but the key points are that, first of all, the, the, the Colombian armed conflict did not begin with the drug trade. Right? The drug trade began with marijuana smuggling in the 1970s, and that, especially along the Caribbean coast. It later moved on to cocaine and cocaine processing in the big Andean cities like Medellin and Cali, where rival cartels uh, fought each other in the 1980s and 90s for distribution and territory. But that was just a chapter in this longer history that, in a contemporary sense, really began in the 1940s, during the beginning of the Cold War. A period remembered in Colombia as La Violencia, or the violence, from roughly 1946 to 1958, set the tone and the foundations for the country's armed struggle that would, that would help define the Colombian experience for the rest of the 20th century and beyond. These images here show, show demonstrations in the city of Medellin, one of the, the second largest city in Colombia. Uh, these are demonstrations in 1957, demanding the resignation of dictator Gustavo Rojas Pinilla, the Colombian dictator who had been uh, in power for the past four years, and who had come to power with the promise of martial law and quelling the violence that had been racking the Colombian countryside since the mid-1940s. 
demanding the replacement of General Rojas, the Colombian government, the Liberal Party with a capital L and the Conservative Party with a capital C, banded together and formed something called the National Front, which was a power sharing agreement between the, the country's two most significant political parties and which rotated the presidency every, every term. During this period of the National Front, when the Colombian government officially pursued policies of, of, uh, of um, restoration in the Colombian countryside, the, uh, both the left-wing guerrilla groups and later the right-wing paramilitary groups the seeds for these movements were, were planted. Uh, so for example, for left-wing guerrilla groups, peasant self-defense organizations in the countryside um, formed in the early 1960s, including the FARC, which formed in the Colombian mountains in 1964. Right-wing paramilitaries were formed often by, uh, by, by corporate interests to protect landed property in rural Colombia. Um, the sugar industry, the banana industry, the petroleum industry, many of these, uh, these groups hired mercenaries and, and private armies to protect their interests in rural Colombia. And it was in this context, which had, had really sort of grown in the 1960s, that, that the 1970s era of drug trafficking began. So by the 1980s, the period that maybe, if, if anybody is familiar with Colombian history, and, and you think, think if anyone thinks about Colombian history, you think about the drug trade in the 1980s. And by that point, the Colombian armed struggle was really a four-tiered struggle between left-wing guerrilla insurgencies, right-wing paramilitaries, the Colombian national military, and um, drug traffickers. All of these groups, the, the, the boundaries between these four groups were, were blurry, and especially uh, when it came to drug trafficking. So by the 1990s, both paramilitaries and left-wing guerrilla insurgencies were engaging in drug trafficking. So why, why does this all matter? By 2014, Colombia was recognized as having the second most internally displaced people in the world after Syria. So by 2014, Colombia is recognized as having the second most internally displaced people after Syria because of this long evolving and multi-tiered struggle. In trying to negotiate a peace to this long history, the FARC, the oldest guerrilla insurgency in the Americas, entered multi-year talks with the Colombian government of Juan Manuel Santos held in Havana, Cuba, beginning in 2012 and 2013. And within Colombia, a rivalry of sorts has developed culturally and politically between leaders of two sides in this political negotiation with the guerrilla. So here we're, at the, we're, we're presiding today within the Allworth Center for Peace and Justice. In Colombia, these words mean two very different things. On the one side in Colombia, the government of President Juan Manuel Santos, who, who negotiated the peace accord with the FARC, is usually associated with the movement for peace. In contrast, Santos' predecessor, Alvaro Uribe, president right before Juan Manuel Santos, is associated with something quite different. He's associated with a movement for justice. And like I said, these are two very different words in Colombia. Those advocating for peace seek, supported the peace accords. They supported a peaceful resolution to this conflict. Those uh, under Uribe's camp supporting justice were, were hesitant to support the peace accord, hesitant at best, and instead pursued uh, criminal justice for the guerrilla insurgencies that they felt uh, were to blame for this long history of violence. So this is the divisions within Colombian society in 2016 when a peace accord was finally signed between the FARC and the Colombian government of Juan Manuel Santos. Peace or justice? I won't go into the 
details of the peace accords too much right now. I will just briefly introduce these and then I'll let you ask questions about this if you are interested. But, but broadly speaking, the Colombian peace accords included uh, five or six key, key areas uh, that were negotiated between the FARC and the government. The first area was comprehensive rural development. And so this goes back to these Cold War struggles that Andre was talking about at the outset, struggles over land reform, struggles over inequality in the countryside. The second point of negotiation was the political participation of the FARC. A, a similar peace accord had attempted to, uh, to come into being in the 1980s. The FARC, many members of the FARC agreed to this accord and were summarily murdered and executed when they attempted to run for local town council offices uh, in 1985. It's estimated that between four and 6,000 FARC politicians, uh, members of the, the, the FARC supported political party, the Union Patriotica, the Patriotic Union, uh, four to 6,000 were murdered despite winning hundreds of elections from town councils to house and senate seats in Colombia. The FARC didn't want that to happen again, obviously, so political participation of the FARC. The third arena of negotiation was illicit drugs, including substitution programs, social assistance plans, dismantling drug networks, et cetera. The fourth issue was that of victims, and especially this question of truth and reconciliation. The establishment of a truth commission, a transitional justice commission, and a peace tribunal. Finally, a ceasefire. How to lay down arms and how to reintegrate FARC combatants into society. In October of 2016, Colombians voted whether or not to ratify the peace accord. 50.2% voted no. This was part of a broader phenomenon in the fall of 2016 in which polls consistently showed what turned out to be inaccurate electoral uh, prospects. In Colombia, the polls showed that the yes vote was likely to win, was likely to succeed. It in fact did not. Um, similarly, in the United States and in Great Britain, within months of this phenomenon, a uh, similar situation occurred. In the Colombian context, a tropical storm, something rare in Colombia, tropical storms typically veer north and, and head into the Gulf of Mexico, a tropical storm nevertheless went sort of through its usual route and then battered the Caribbean coast of Colombia, which prevented a lot of people from going to the polls and may have helped explain this situation. So this map shows the, the uh, places in Colombia that voted yes, places in green, and those that had a majority no vote, places in red. These maps show demographics in Colombia. The map on the left shows the country's Afro-Colombian population. The map on the right shows the country's indigenous population. So the red zones and orange zones have higher percentages of either Afro-Colombians or indigenous peoples. I'll show you the previous slide again. Green is yes, red is no. Afro-Colombians and indigenous peoples. Progressive supporters of the peace treaty which was eventually ratified after, after this uh, electoral um, uh, controversy. Supporters of the peace treaty support it, but they still worry. They worry about the new right-wing uh, right president, Ivan Duque, and a lack of progress in carrying out the agreement since 2016. Peace, for some, peace is seen as opening Colombian territory to a new boom for extractive industries particularly in gold mining, cattle ranching, oil palm, and petroleum. In this regard, some consider the peace to be a neoliberal peace, going back to what Andra was talking about with economic restructuring in Chile. One without protections for indigenous or Afro-descended peoples or environmental uh, regulations. Some see it as a new growth strategy of speculation and development. 
And according to multiple outlets from Human Rights Watch to Reuters, Colombia was the world's deadliest country for environmental activists in 2019. And according to the United Nations, since the peace accords in 2016, over 400 human rights activists have been killed in Colombia, the highest number in the world, many of those indigenous and Afro-Colombian. So this said distinction, unfortunately, is not a phenomenon unique to, to Colombia. In Brazil, right-wing President Jair Bolsonaro openly taunts the indigenous community and promotes extractive industries in the Amazon, where indigenous groups are the widespread target of land occupations and violence. In Colombia, the situation has been further complicated by an international refugee crisis. Chaos is, has become the norm in neighboring Venezuela, where governance is contested between two rival claims to legitimacy. The situation in Venezuela intensified in 2017 amidst economic turmoil and widespread shortages for basic necessities like food and medicine. In 2019, a political standoff after a contested election catalyzed massive public mobilization that engulfed the international community, but still has not been resolved. In the meantime, 5.6 million Venezuelans have fled their country, many walking, walking across the Andes Mountains with whatever they carry on their backs. Some walk and hitchhike across the Andes all the way to Ecuador or Peru or to Chile. Others stay in Colombia, Venezuela's neighbor. Over 1.7 million Venezuelans have settled in Colombia reversing the trend of the past half century, during which time Colombians fleeing the armed conflict and drug violence sought safe haven in Venezuela. So in February of just this year, the Colombian government announced it would offer legal status to almost 1 million undocumented Venezuelan refugees, an act that the UN High Commissioner for Refugees lauded for its, quote, extraordinary generosity. Meanwhile, however, tensions mounted within Colombia. Protesters filled the streets to oppose the policies of the conservative government of Ivan Duque, which despite its offer of temporary protection status to Venezuelan migrants, has failed to ease the country's deep divisions. Remember the plebiscite vote, 50.2% of the vote. At issue during the massive protests of this past year was the government's COVID-19 response, inequality, rights to public space in Colombia's cities, and especially police brutality. In Colombia, the police are militarized and part of the National Ministry of Defense, a legacy of the 20th century Cold War and armed conflict, including the US-led Plan Colombia, which delivered almost $10 billion of US aid to Colombia between 2000 and 2016. 71% of that $10 billion went to the country's military and police forces. Protesters in Colombia feel that a meaningful and lasting peace can only be achieved if the country demilitarizes and denationalizes its police force, breaking the lingering ties to the military, militarized and covert Cold War in Latin America, of which Plan Colombia is seen as being part. A new era of peace in a new century, demonstrators argue, must break free of the strangling grip of, of, strangling grip of the past. Memories and artifacts of the very hot Cold War in Latin America are everywhere. From a president in Brazil who defends the country's Cold War era military dictatorship to the street protests in Chile over the legacies of inequality led by the, left by the constitution and the economy designed by that country's dictatorship. From the fragile peace process in Colombia with the hemisphere's oldest and largest guerrilla insurgency, from protests recently in Cuba over the, over the continuation of that country's socialist regime, to clampdowns in Nicaragua, where one-time revolutionaries have become the oppressive establishment. An ongoing reckoning with the politics and legacies of the Cold War seems to be occurring everywhere across the region. Even in the US territory of Puerto Rico, battered by storms, earthquakes, and bankruptcy, and humiliated by the condescending attitude of politicians from the mainland, furious protesters took to the streets in 2019 and demanded new representation. The spark that ignited this movement was a political scandal involving lewd, racist, and misogynist group chats between the governor and his cabinet. But underlying this anger and what propelled a million people into the streets on an island of just over 3 million was what many perceive to be the neo-colonialism of the US Congress's establishment of PROMESA, which means promise in Spanish, but is also an acronym 
for the plan to uh, of instituting an economic oversight board that manages the island's debt restructuring through financial austerity policies and privatization of infrastructure, particularly the electrical grid. So earlier this year, the Commonwealth's electric utility was privatized and transferred to a corporate consortium of, of Alberta and Texas-based energy companies. As before in neoliberal Chile or in other debt-ridden countries in the 1980s like, like Mexico, privatization and structural adjustment policies settle over Puerto Rico amidst a 21st century set of threats that now include climate change and continuing inequality gaps. The world often feels like it is turned upside down these days. And right here in Minnesota, we've become a critical node in the struggle for racial reckoning. Of course, as we all know, we've experienced a global pandemic, protest movements for women's rights, a series of showdowns over oil and natural gas pipelines involving a complex set of issues, including the environment, indigenous sovereignty, and labor and economic development. We've seen a historic summer drought and accompanying wildfires that brought back memories of the catastrophic fires a century ago in 1918. And this is just in Minnesota, to say nothing of wildfires in the Western US and Canada, hurricanes, and of course, climate change, which as we speak is once again being discussed in Glasgow by the United Nations. These are anxious times. But in Latin America, throughout the theories of the Cold War and into the present moment of social and political reckoning, many people have long felt like they were walking in a world turned upside down. Latin Americans experienced some of the worst furies of the Cold War and had their own century of revolutionary and counter-revolutionary struggle. Many of the global issues grabbing headlines the past few years from the dangers of COVID-19 to the fragility of electoral democracy, from climate change and structural racism and violence against women and indigenous peoples, these have been especially acute in parts of Latin America where they graft onto histories of inequality and political and economic volatility exacerbated by the long global Cold War. In Latin America, the anxieties of the past couple of years are just the latest chapter in a long struggle. And yet Latin America offers examples of bold hope and resilience. The wave of global protests set off by the killing of George Floyd in Minneapolis ushered in a new reckoning with structural racism and violence in places like Mexico and Colombia. In Mexico, this social movement galvanized momentum to uncover new evidence about collusion between police authorities and organized crime organizations and the disappearance of 43 students from the Ayotzinapa Rural Teachers College in 2014. In Colombia, the Black Lives Matter movement emboldened protesters decrying a long history of police violence in a country where the police are detached from local administration through a governance structure in which policing is housed under the National Military of Defense and is milita militarized through international funding st stemming from the US-led war on drugs. These protests against police violence and systemic inequality came to a climax in the summer of 2021 in the working class neighborhoods of the city of Cali, the largest urban center in the largely Afro-Colombian Pacific cultural region. Latin Americans, especially young people, women and indigenous and Afro-descended citizens have seized global momentum to confront historical legacies of state terror and inequality. In Argentina, the COVID-19 pandemic prevented large social gatherings to commemorate and remember the disappeared on the 45th anniversary of the 1976 military coup in March of 2021. Instead, people went outside individually and in small groups to commemorate a day of remembrance for truth and justice, planting 30,000 trees, one for each of the victims who were disappeared during the state terror of the country's Cold War military regime. Organizers, including the mothers and grandmothers of the disappeared, declared, quote, in times of fires, deforestation, and climate change, we invite you to plant life as an act of memory and future. In his Nobel Prize acceptance speech in 1982, the Colombian novelist Gabriel Garcia Marquez quoted William Faulkner and declared, I decline to accept the end of man. And facing the terrors of the Cold War in Latin America and the global possibility of nuclear obliteration, Garcia Marquez proposed, quote, a new and sweeping utopia of life where no one will be able to decide for others how they die, where love will prove true and happiness be possible, and where the race is condemned to 100 years of solitude will have at last and forever a second opportunity on earth. Now, nearly 40 years later, Elisa Loncon, a Mapuche activist, is serving as president of the Chilean Constitutional Convention and will attempt to reconstruct that country's governing structure 
through the replacement of the 1980 Constitution designed by Augusto Pinochet and the military regime. Why should people in the United States follow the 21st century dispatches from Latin America? Because in the 20th century, Latin America's long history of social inequality came to a fore as the region became a violent epicenter in the struggles of the global Cold War. Now, the region is again an epicenter in a global struggle, but this time it is one of reckoning, reconstruction, and justice. Thanks. <laughs> but uh, we'd like to take a few minutes for questions. People up and down here, the microphone. Uh, in the meantime, uh, folks at home on Zoom can type in a question. Uh, Brianna, I don't know where you are, but I don't think this thing is working very well because I'm not seeing any any questions. But um, Are there any in the audience? I mean, this one says here. Oh, yeah, it should pop up there. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Huh. Well, well, you can use this space. <laughs> OK, I was just afraid to touch it. You know. Well, I, I appreciate okay. that. OK, well, that's not very helpful. Oh, that was an old one. Oh, OK. Here. Oh. All right, Looks well. Like there's none on Zoom yet. Let me ask a question while Brian figures things out. Remember, I thanked her for all her technological <laughs> wizardry. Well, let's let's see. It. I think this is what you're going to use right here. Okay. So far, there are no questions there. But of, as we all know, I don't know who, which one of you wants to respond to this, but I'll just put it out there, and you two can fight it out. But there's all these refugees coming primarily from Latin America, across the Mexican border. Why is this happening now? Why didn't it happen in the 1980s or in the 1990s or any of the other historical periods that you talked about? What's different today? <laughs> it did happen in the 1980s. It, it did happen in the 1980s and 90s. And in fact, it was mostly Central American uh, young people in, in East Los Angeles who um, wound up in California state prisons where many of the, where many of the gangs like, like Mara Salvatrucha, Mara um, MS-13 were formed um, in these California prisons. And then when those people were deported and went back to Central America, they brought the gangs back to Central America with them. And, and uh, so now a lot of the refugees are fleeing sort of this post-conflict society that's mm -hmm. largely uh, sort of overrun by, by informal criminal organizations, um, as, well as, as well as climate change, which is, you know. Okay, so it sounds better. like, if I can interpret your answer, it's partly, but, it, but it's more in the news today and Americans are, that is citizens of the United States, seem to be playing a bigger role and not necessarily a positive role um, is, is that because things change in the United States, not that they change in Latin America. Yeah, I guess I would say that it's important to, yeah, the, there's a, the difference between just, you know, actually documenting numbers of people leaving or, you know, arriving as immigrants versus yeah, what we see in the news and the headlines, because those are often not necessarily correlated. And there's a lot, I mean, there's political uses of um, this anti-immigrant rhetoric. And it's also, it's happening in the US, but it's also happening in Latin America. Um, in, in Chile, actually, there's a lot of xenophobia as well against migrants uh, from Venezuela and from Haiti. And so I think it's, I guess I see it as a commonality. It's politically expedient to certain groups to to vilify um, immigrants, um, and for, but it's not. It's not, that's a different question than you know the reasons why people are coming. Um, mm -hmm. If that makes sense. I would quickly add that one important aspect. This is a much broader topic, but one important aspect in studying migration patterns and policies is 
is the establishment of by migrant groups of of uh, of networks. Mm -hmm. And so the first waves of refugees from the civil wars in the 1980s came over and established these sort of community networks um, in places like Los Angeles and New Jersey and Long mm -hmm. Island. And and now with these networks established, more and more people um, have, been, mm -hmm. have been coming over in Let's recent see. decades. Mm -hmm. Thank you. There's another question here in the audience, but I'm gonna ask one that just came in ahead of you and then and then you can go next all right this this is coming from uh, zoom land um, and and this person congratulates both of you on wonderful presentations and asks if one or both of you would comment on the role of the catholic church in the latin american cold war um, my understanding is that it varied a lot by um, different locations um, in chile the the catholic church um, served once once um, Pinochet took power um, during the dictatorship, the Catholic Church served as a kind of umbrella protector group of um, those who were being persecuted. So they had a little bit more, they were kind of had a buffer from the, the persecution. And so different, um, you know, political groups um, allied themselves with progressive Catholic organizations to try to um, you know, for example, to try to find loved ones who had been um, killed or disappeared, um, and to also organize against the effects of the economic austerity when there was such significant poverty, you know, organizing soup kitchens and things like that. But that also was integrating like new political um, kind of grassroots activism um, in conjunction with the Catholic Church. But um, my understanding is that that like the Catholic Church was more um, supportive of the dictatorship in Argentina, for example. Yeah, I would agree. I would say that the Catholic Church as, as, a, as a massive and diverse organization um, had different roles in different places and, and had its own internal struggle about what to do during this mm -hmm. period. Some, some Catholic priests were radicalized and joined violent, uh, motivated by liberation theology, joined violent insurgencies. Camilo Torres was a priest in Colombia who joined the, the ELN, uh, in the 1960s and and was 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 killed in in combat so um, a number of you know different sects of the catholic church took different paths thank you and we have a question here in the audience you want to come and use the microphone please everybody can hear out there in zoom land if you use the microphone too um hi i so i noticed that initiatives like the peace accords address a breadth of different social issues, but um, to me that seems like a really, although it seems like a very successful approach, it also seems really idealistic to focus on a lot of social issues like that. I'm wondering um, more specifically if, um, I, I'm, I'm curious as to the extent of say starting with like a small, uh, not necessarily, a smaller big issue uh, within this umbrella of issues, um, like the extent to which the drug problem uh, could potentially be addressed and then um, have almost a butterfly effect in helping to solve the equity issues. Um, so I suppose my question is, uh, if you could comment on the extent to the drug, the drug issues um, and how that could affect the rest of social change in terms of equity. Yeah, no, thank you for the question. Um, so, I mean, I think you're right, the, you know, the, the peace accords, um, in order to get all parties at the table, you know, there, there are many different issues that are part of the accords. Some would argue not enough. Um, so, uh, so yeah, I mean, that's, the, I think that's a, a, a smart observation. There's a lot there, right? There's a lot to work through. In terms of the, in terms of drug trafficking and the drug trade, um, you know, the, the, the leftist guerrilla insurgency groups, although they began really uh, engaging in the drug trade on a, on a wide scale in the 1990s, that wasn't the origin of these, these groups, that they um, predated the drug trade and were not the, the main players in the drug trade uh, for most of their history. And so, um, so that's an important part of this, but, but yeah, I, I think, uh, you know, focusing exclusively on the drug trade, for example, wouldn't necessarily bring the FARC to the table because they weren't the main, they wouldn't see themselves as being the main players in that issue. Um, in terms of the drug trade right now, and the president, uh, the president is, uh, of Colombia right now is Ivan Duque, and he has, um, 
The, his, his administration is trying to restart aerial fumigation campaigns with glyphosate uh, in the, in, to try to eradicate coca in, in Colombia. And this is extraordinarily controversial. It was banned for a while, and he's looking to restart this in order to try to eradicate the growing of coca, which um, you know, critics, critics say is more, is more ecologically and, and, uh, and sort of ecologically and socially destructive than it is actually effective. So it's, a, it's an extraordinarily controversial issue in Colombia, and it's one that's actually in the courts right now. So, um, so yeah, it's, it's ongoing. It's an ongoing set of, set of circumstances, yeah. Thank you. Is there another question here? Go right ahead and up to the mic. I'm curious, I mean- A little bit closer to the mic. Uh, I'm curious that both of you look to be younger and I have to assume that you're gonna to try to continue to uh, report and study this area for a long time into the future. And our own experience in our own political culture right now is that uh, we, from our own experience, uh, can't even agree upon uh, what the vote turnout was in the last presidential election. And you've described enormous conflict through almost every one of these uh, countries. Do you have, any sources of uh, like uh, oh, information and stuff that you study that you believe gives you some idea about uh, something that might be called truth? Or is it a matter that you're more reduced into just he said, she said uh, from the two political sides and the various factions? That's an interesting question. Um, battles over, so it's an interesting question. I think that misinformation is a challenge not only in the US, but certainly in Latin America. Um, and similar to our situation here, um, there's a, one, of the, one of the challenges is sort of who controls the media, right? Um, in Brazil, for example, there's um, major corporate control by um, kind of right-leaning groups. Um, and let's see, I, so I, I know that like misinformation is, has been a kind of a driver of some of the um, conflicts in Brazil, um, but I think that, I, I don't think that the question over truth is, has exploded in the same way in, in Chile. Um, I don't know if what you would say to that, Tim. Um, yeah, I think that, so the, these are, I mean, these, look, I think, I think that the, if, if there's any takeaway to this, right, is that the United States is in no way unique in having this extraordinary division uh, socially and politically. Um, you know, as we see in Colombia and Chile and, and other many other places across Latin America, not to mention other continents, we see this sort of this sort of divisiveness as a as a you know a reflection of our of our time. So um, so so I think you know I, I don't have a, I don't have a strong answer to that. I, I think that you know the 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 uh, the only thing I can say is that this is this is a, a global phenomenon that we're all living through in real time. Um, you know, as historians, we, we, we do our best to triangulate our sources and, and use multiple sources, and that's what we teach our students to do. Um, and so, uh, you know, that's sometimes the best, best one can do. I would also add the, the question of truth. I, mean, I think you mentioned this in your presentation, but um, it's also very much tied to um, excavating the truth about human rights abuses, and um, a lot of the, you know, lack of knowledge is you know, trying, citizens trying to find out what is happening behind, you know, the kind of um, obscurity of when, you know, someone gets arrested, um, trying to figure out what has happened uh, with police forces. Um, so the, the push for truth and reconciliation is, you know, has a long history, but is still very present today. Um, and I agree that an important mission for us as historians is to get at, you know, to, to, Use reliable sources. Teach our teach our students critical thinking, um, and that's as true in Latin America with you know our colleagues historians there as it is here in the U.S. Thank you very much. Um, I think maybe we should quit, <laughs> <laughs> um, but we're not really done yet. Th those of you who are in the hall have an advantage. This is one of the advantages of coming here in person instead of doing it on Zoom, because out there in the lobby, there uh, should be a little buffet, uh, some refreshments, and we can continue the conversation one-on-one -on -one with one another or with our speakers. Thank you all very much for coming, and thanks to both of you for 
putting on a very fine presentation, both of you. Thank you. Can we just sustain that for a second for Tom Morgan? Thank you one more time, Tom. Yeah.